Hello and welcome back to another episode of Henry Weston's Old Make the Podcast. Tonight or today is Turf Chat. I am joined by James Matthewman. Those on the YouTube video will see him over there. Before we get over to James and talk about the interesting greenkeeping content today, if you're watching us on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to us on an app on a podcast provider such as Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, just like the show, share the show. Offer us a five-star review if you could. You know, there's numerous ways to do it. You can write reviews as well. Uh, and we do have a Buy Me A Coffee page just set up, allowing you to make a small donation to the podcast. That just keeps us going. But don't feel like you have to. I'll provide all the links in the show notes. Like I say, we're talking turf. James Matthewman is with me. Anyone who is on turf Twitter will know James. He's a bit of a celebrity now. So I'm going to go over straight over to James. I'll say, hello, James. How are you? Um Please give us an introduction, although some might say you need no introduction at the moment. <laughs> I still thank you uh, for having me on the show um, or podcast. Yeah. Uh, I apologise for my Welsh accent because a lot of people will... Uh, <laughs> we'll put subtitles it. on if we have to. <laughs> you probably will have to if I start uh, speaking too fast anyway. But uh, no, where do I start? I mean... Um, Ah, how I got into greenkeeping would be a good start. Um, let's go right back to the beginning. Uh, when I was, let me think now, I think I was about 12 years old. My parents split up, a bit of a tough time for any uh, for any child. Uh, what happened was we came out of school. One of my friends, Wayne, he said, do you fancy going to the snooker hall? So uh, <laughs> I think it was actually during the class time as well, which was a bit naughty. So I hope my mother doesn't listen to this, but uh, <laughs> we went to the snooker hall and um, yeah, we had a couple of frames and I remember, I think we were about four or five frames in and I made a, a 30 odd break and one of the old guys with a pipe was sitting there and he was like, oh, how long have you been playing, boy? And I was like, oh, I said, this is my first, uh, first time playing. And he was like, no, no, seriously, how long have you been playing? I said, no, honestly, it's my first time playing. And I always remember him saying to me, he goes, you need to stick to this. And I did. And uh, about 12 months later, I made my first century. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then um, I think from 13 on then, I entered the Welsh, um, sorry, like the Welsh Amateurs, which was at Terry Griffiths in uh, Senesley. And yeah, I had a really good career out there. I went all over the world. I uh, went to Latvia, went to Russia, um, played in the Welsh Internationals, had my Welsh jacket. And um, yeah, I had my first competitive 147 at uh, 19, I think I was. Crikey. Um, yeah, so I'd done pretty well in that. And uh, yeah, it, it sort of ended when I was coming home on the plane from Russia, funny enough. And um, I just said to my mother, I said, I, I can't. I can't do it no more. It's just, it's too difficult, the mental strain. And my all my friends were sort of progressing and, you know, a few of them were turning professional. And I just, you know, it, it really did hurt at that time. So, like I said, I said, uh, you know, I'm retiring at the tender age of 19 or 20. I still played local league for a few years, but from, like, trying to turn professional, I finished then. And, uh, yeah, my mother said, well, look, you know, you need to get a full-time job. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to fund you completely. So, yeah, I uh, went to my local golf club and I asked the pro, is there any hours in the pro shop taking money, which I did. I ended up doing a few hours a week. And then um, the head greenkeeper came over then and said, oh, you know, are you looking for a job? And I was like, well, yeah. And he, so we went out to the greens. I think it was a temporary green it was. And he said, uh, jump on this mower over here. And this is Steve now. This is my boss yeah. right now. And uh, he said, there's Mo, there's Lift. He goes, try and get the timing right yourself. Have a bit of a play because it was only a temporary green. And I did it perfectly. And he said, oh, do you, do you think you could do that? And I said, well, I said, it doesn't seem completely difficult. But yeah, I'll have a go. He goes, good, you've got a full-time job. And it literally went from there. I was think that, I was... Uh, was that an old Toro Greens mower with Mo and Lift on the foot pedals back in the day? That was the one, yeah. It yeah. Was more than yeah, I remember them. So, yeah, I don't miss them if I'm perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the horrible thing. <laughs> so that's and that's your golf club now. So your your current position, your deputy head greenkeeper, are you, James? Yeah, that's the. Sorry, I forgot to mention that was at uh, Lakeside Golf Club. That was where mm -hmm. I started, and then obviously I left Lakeside because 
bit of a weird story. I left Lakeside, went to my steak, and then Steve ended up in my steak. So we ended up back together. Oh, okay. I guess. So, yeah, I've worked with Steve for like 18, 18 years now, I think it is, something like that. But, um, but yeah, I'm at currently at my state golf club and I'm a deputy head greenkeeper and Steve is um, head greenkeeper. Okay. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been pretty good since. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not a bad industry, is it? We all, everyone, everyone likes a moan and a groan about whatever they do. But as far as uh, jobs go, there are a lot worse things we could be doing, aren't there? Oh yeah, yeah. It, you know, you've got a lot of people like say in the industry. I, I you know, I, I do think the industry is in a little bit of trouble because obviously the ones that are in it now are what I like to call the hardcore greenkeepers, where they've done it obviously quite a long time, you know. Yeah. And obviously, I, I, I don't. I don't feel like there is anyone sort of new coming in to the industry. Like, you know, I, I've had a word, but I did have a word with the colleges near me. Uh, well, the college, sorry, not colleges. And I asked if there was any apprentices or anyone, and there literally was no one. So it is a little bit worrying, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen well, in the future, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll post a link to a podcast I did with uh, Anthony uh, and Simon. And Anthony... Uh, is a lecturer at our local college, Hadlow College down here in Kent. And I was actually surprised. I assumed that, you know, I was going to be talking to Anthony about uh, the amount or, or where are, you know, what, why aren't kids getting into greenkeeping? And he actually said down here in Kent, their intake for students on the greenkeeping and horticulture courses is at the highest it's been for 10 years. But what he went on to explain to me was the problem down here is those youngsters getting into it in high numbers are only hanging around in the industry for a maximum of four years. Most of them are leaving after two or three. So I'd, I knew people weren't hanging around, but I didn't actually realise that there was still, certainly down in this part of the country, there seems to be a strong interest in joining the industry, but we are then not able to retain them. Uh, and then I think it's widely publicised, isn't it, that the money quite isn't there and pot potentially the hours and being out in the wind and rain aren't for the new generation. Uh, but that's something for another podcast, or that's certainly something for a past podcast, yeah. James. Um, yeah. I've approached you because... I don't want to say you're the most famous man on local Twitter at the moment, but your, <laughs> your, your videos are being heavily viewed uh, and heavily, I don't want to say critiqued because they're not, they're just being, they've been met with a wonderful amount of positive feedback, aren't they? Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think, not too bad. <laughs> well, you know, seven, 8,000 views on one that I looked at. I'm not sure where the numbers, there, there may be some that have gone higher than that, but um Talk, just explain just before we go what we're going to do i should probably tell the listeners and the viewers what we're actually going to do me and james are going to go through the topics that james has posted videos about uh he's posted videos about the leather jackets some top dressing pitch mark repair bunker raking and i'm not sure if there's anything else i'll, I'll get james to talk me through that if there is but we thought it'd be a good time to sort of have a little industry discussion with regards to these topics that james has been putting out and the fact that um well, the, the fact that we're going to, that you've been doing that and it's been met with such positive feedback, James, to me yeah. says one, that it's relevant and two, you have a certain personality that people enjoy watching and have continued to watch and are more than happy to, to tell you what they think of it. And they, they all seem to think they're wonderful. And I, I would 100% agree. Uh, just tell me behind the thinking of, well, not the thinking, I, I know why you did the videos, because I assume you want to raise awareness. But was it a was it a big decision or did you just think I'll put one out there and see how it goes? And if it flops or, you know, I can always take it down or or was there a was there a real passion? Like you, I think the first one was the leather jackets, was it? James? Yeah, well, I, it, it, I tell you, I was started in in my stig. A lot of the members were they, they're very curious to know sort of why we do certain things so like whether it's renovation work and how long seed takes to come through in the greens and they, they, they are generally some of them are generally interested so I thought I did a couple of videos just for the local um the you know the local page of the golf club and they really really enjoyed it so a couple of them said oh you know why don't you try talking about um you know it to a, a bigger a bigger scale so <laughs> Lo and behold, our sixth green was just absolutely rife with uh, 
leather jacket. So I thought, you know, <laughs> I'll park them over there. And I'll um, go and have a wander because it was bank holiday. It was uh, quite quiet because it was early. And I just thought, I'll try it. And I'll, you know, try and explain what's going on, why the Greens are struggling. And that video just went absolutely crazy, that one did. So, like I said, it, I didn't really explain in the first one what they were. So I said, oh, I'll do a part two. So, of course, all of them were then in the clubhouse and they were like, oh, when when's the part two? I said, oh, I'll, I'll do it. I'll let you know when it comes out. So, of course, I posted that one and then that one done brilliant as well. So I just thought, I said to Steve, I said, do you know what? I, I think it might be a great idea to do simple videos. Don't overcomplicate it. Just, you know, explain why we do the certain jobs um, and then mix it up a bit as well. Not just the jobs. So like with bunker raking or um, repairing pitch marks, explain how it's done properly. Because like half of them couldn't believe when they were repairing a pitch mark, they thought you had to lift it from the bottom. And I, I was like, no, that's not how you do it. And they were like, I, I, you know, we can't believe we've been doing it wrong for like 15 years. I said, well, yeah. I said, you know, it's great that you've been repairing the pitch mark. And yes, I, I wouldn't say there's a perfect way because it, it will repair, even lifting it from the bottom, but it will take a lot longer to repair doing yeah. it that way where you know you lift from the back and push in and from the sides push in and they were like my god if we've noticed straight away doing it like that now how quick is repairing and it's actually and it, yeah if you actually once you once you get the technique half down it's actually an easier way to repair a pitch mark as well isn't it yeah it is <laughs> it's, it is quite simple and a lot of them have been coming on to me saying oh we, we, you know we can't believe how simple it is now and I was like, well, you know, I said, I'm good because the video has obviously worked, you know, and they've, they've admitted that as well. So, yeah, it just kind of went from there then. And I said, I'm doing the videos and I'm trying to keep, it's hard because in my head, I'm trying to revert what I've learned and from college and previous experience. But then I've got to try and remember, I'm putting it across to someone that hasn't got a clue about, you know, agriculture and green keeping and everything. So I, I've got to try and maintain that um sort of consistency where I keep it nice and nice and simple for them to understand, you know. And it you know it, it is a bit of a challenge and I've only got two minutes as well. Yeah. But because um, Twitter only allows I think it's two minutes twenty seconds. But uh but yeah, you know they, they they're not uh like I, I try to do them in one take. I so far every one of them has been in one take. <laughs> but uh, and yeah, Steve likes to put it, them up in one take. So he said, if you make a mistake, it's going up. He said, people will love it more if you make a mistake. So you know, we've kind of uh, agreed to that. But yeah, it's not you know, it, I I do prepare for them as well. You know, I I don't just turn up on the morning and I'll just speak. I do sort of prepare for it. I, I'm not going to say scripted because I know I sort of know what I'm going to be talking about. But I I love like little little sort of notes and that but but yeah, yeah it's just... i mean that's what believe people might not believe me but i even do notes on here <laughs> for those listening on the audio i have just shown off my notes onto the youtube video uh, so james um let's what we, what this will allow us to do today is there'll be green keepers listening to this and hopefully you know we 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 will discuss things uh, and some green keepers might you know, think we're teaching them to suck eggs. That's not what we're trying to do here. But hopefully this can go out to members as well. So what we'll do is we'll start with the leather jackets and we will explain it as best we can from a couple of guys who've been in the trade for a while. We won't, you know, we're not trying to teach greenkeepers new things here. They might be interested. They might even be listening to this to try and pick me up on what I don't know. Um, <laughs> but your leather jacket video. So the leather jacket, a leather jacket is basically a crane fly larvae, isn't it? That is, yeah. is created or it's put into the ground to to grow uh, it's it's born into that thatch layer as a larvae and from a greenkeeping perspective it's double bubble for us isn't it because what we get is we get as these leather jackets hatch out they start to attack and feed on the roots of the grass and then we also have the birds above yeah. ground trying to peck down so what yeah you get getting a, you're getting a double sort of uh blow when they because obviously they're eating the roots to start with i mean you know especially winter time as well where they're eating everything you know you've got birds 
Peck in the head. Like we we just we've suffered so bad with Peck in. It's like to the point now where we've had to physically repair each Peck because yeah. obviously they make them creators in the green. So it's like like I said, you're losing the roots underneath, and you're obviously losing the surface on the top as well because of it. And you know they just I said years ago there was a instant chemical to solve the problem and now oh, yeah i mean years ago people would have i mean there was products such as crossfire um where your green keeper you know if you're listening to this as a golf club member you probably wouldn't even have known it was going on your green keeper would have gone out gone out he would have he'd have a rough idea from experience when he needs to go out and spray or he may have waited for the obvious signs uh and he would go out and he would make an application of a product and that would stop the larvae in its tracks. And you would literally not have to worry about it for the rest of the year. Maybe you'd make two applications a year that, yeah. you know, it's down to finances. It's down to your own personal philosophy in a sense as well, isn't it? But they yeah. weren't as, as has been proven, you know, it's not something, you know, like, we'll go on you guys are sort of fungicide free down where you are on your greens really or, or but with regards to insecticides and stuff it's not something you can just make the bold decision i'm not going to use them because because of what's showing now you end up anyone who you know plays football down their local rec will know what a worn out gold mouth looks like um yeah golf courses throughout the UK, throughout the world are now suffering. If you go onto a golf green and you go, what the hell is your green keeper doing? There's no grass. It, we can, if it is leather jacket based, yeah. these green keepers are not in a position. It's an unfair fight at the minute, isn't it? We're not in a position. I mean, a celeprine has been allowed as a one-off use per season. I, I think, I, I don't know if they carried that over for this season. Last season, they made an exemption, didn't they? So green keepers do have sort of one line of defense, James, but it's not, yeah. it's, it's still proving to be, and, and that doesn't come cheap, let's be honest. No, um, so I it's, know it's, it's very expensive. And, and like I said, that, that, that was the main reason I did the video to begin with, because all the members were sort of, yeah, I, I, our members are quite good. They, they are one or two of us at every golf club, but, you know, they were questioning and I just thought, you know, we're working really hard and then, to, for people to think, you know, we don't know what we're doing or we're not doing our job properly. It was just, I just, you know, it, enough was enough in the end. I, I, I had to explain, you know, what was going on, basically. So did you and, uh, did you do a video? Did your video include matting the greens? Uh, the second video, yeah, we trialled the, uh, the sheeting. But sheeting, the prob- yeah. Yeah, the problem with it is we ha- you, you need a very good irrigation system to you know to make that work and our irrigation system is absolutely diabolical if i'm being honest with you <laughs> that's for another time right <laughs> you're not still running old pvc pipes under there with very little honestly, pressure are you honestly i i could talk for two hours about our irrigation system but uh like oh it's it is absolutely shocking and like i said you know when people were giving me the advice because obviously i i'd seen the sheet in but i didn't know exactly how to uh, go about the process obviously they they said to um dampen the area give it a, quite a good soaking first then sheet it and then some, some of them were soaking it again and on top but uh we tried it we did give it a good uh soaking because we had the um you know the hose and we gave a section a good hose down but we came the next day and there was just hardly any on the surface so we just thought we we're just wasting our time might as well just uh <laughs> let them eat in it <laughs> yeah well i mean i i personally have no experience of of sheeting we we're lucky well we're not lucky we do experience quite a lot of pecking but compared to what i have seen some pictures and some videos posted on twitter down at st george's where i am we are lucky we we it is a problem but we are certainly not losing you know people are losing greens and whole fairways almost with the problem we 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 haven't experienced that so much fortunately um so tell me what was I, I've seen the reaction on Twitter uh, within the Green King community to that individual video, but how did the members react to that first video you did, James? Well, uh, a good thing was we've had a change of committee as well, and um, I'll be honest, straight away they said, "Do you know what we?" 
they didn't really apologize <laughs> but they honestly they, they said we didn't realize what you are up against and it was brilliant for them to understand because i think you know i'm not going to say they they thought we weren't doing our job because they like i said they are very supportive of us but do you know when you you kind of have in the back of your mind that you know they got those doubts but mm-hmm. after seeing that i think they've realized now what we are up against so yeah. it, it, it has made a massive impact at our club. And I, I hope it has. This is why I'm trying to get other golf clubs involved. I, I'm not doing the videos for Greenkeepers because Greenkeepers know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, there's, there's loads I don't know. I'm still learning every day. I, I learn off Twitter all the time. And, you know, there's, there's loads of guys on there that I love following because I'm just in awe of some of them with some of the stuff they come out with. So I'm still learning every day. But like I said, I'm just doing you know sort of the basics for golfers to understand why why greenkeepers do things and you know they, they are trying their best at the end of the day they're trying to you know give them the best experience they can you know at the end of the day they're paying money to play they they they, they, they don't want them to play on a you know a, a terrible golf course they're trying to produce the best they can so that's why i'm, I'm not doing the videos to show what goes in to producing a you know terrific golf course at the end of the day well, the next thing to yeah, exactly, and the next thing to which is it's we'll talk about top dressing, and it shouldn't be controversial because uh, it it's it's a necessary evil, and in my eyes, really, it's not really an evil. The modern way that we top dress now, little and often, really is the way yeah. most people are going, uh, and it's not that disruptive. But you will still get. Let's use a, a common criticism or a common comment from somebody you might see on the golf course oh you've just got them nice and now you're covering them in sand Uh, and we're not covering them in sand. i mean 1998 i started greenkeeping Uh, i remember my first experience of top dressing we did cover them in sand properly covered them in sand (laughs) Uh, you know tons and tons of the stuff because we only did it once possibly twice a year but but the top dressing really the 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 basics of top dressing is we're trying to smooth out the surface, aren't we, James? We're trying to yeah. apply a small bit of sand yeah. to basically sit into the imp- imperfections on that yeah. sort of yeah. top layer, uh, and that will, over time, obviously, it has the added yeah. benefit. It will have a small amount of nutrient release, blah blah blah, and it has the added benefit that it's going to you're putting in what you want into your soil profile. Um, yeah. that's it. How Again, uh, was that met with, did you have members who came up to you and said, oh, I didn't really, I never really understood, but it, it's good to know or? Well, I, I, we recently done a light dress and, and, you know, a couple of members come on to me and they were like, you know, what, what, what you know, what, the greens were looking decent, like you said, and, you know, why are you covering them in sand? I was like, well, for me, right, when I was playing golf years ago, I don't play as much now, but I used to like playing on top dress screens because the sand, what I tried to explain to them, it fills in the voids. So because all the voids you've got, if you if you put a decent dressing on, all those voids are, are then covered. Then you've got this, and especially if you, like we try and roll the greens as well uh, when the sand is dry enough. So it, you know, it really gets into the profile. So you've got, you've got this pure surface then. And do you know, when I explained that to them then, they were like, oh yeah, you're right. The ball does actually roll quite good after it. So it's like... <laughs> You know, when, when you when you try and just break it down in what is it, layman terms, is that the right yeah, saying? Yeah. When you break it down, they, they kind of understand then. They're like, Oh, do you know what? It actually does make sense. And like I said, that's that would that was the other reason for the video because I thought, you know, I'll, I'll put it as simple as I can, you know, it you know improves the soil structure, it fills in the voids. And they were all like, Do you know what? Good video again, James. And then like I said, it sort of it went on from there and that's like you yeah. said, it, it, they had some good feedback, so I just kind of kept doing them. It, it, and it is, it, it sounds silly, isn't it, that you don't know what you don't know. And if you're not told, and rightly or wrongly, if you don't choose to educate yourself, because, I mean, if I, was a, I, if I wasn't a greenkeeper, I, I quite like golf like yourself. I don't play as much as I probably could or should anymore. Um, if I was a golfer and not a greenkeeper, would I educate myself? Probably not. If I'm perfectly honest, I wouldn't go and I wouldn't look up greenkeeping videos on YouTube. So I might see the greenkeeper going out there and putting sand down and then I'm putting behind it uh, and wonder why. 
if the if through my membership, if I'm a member at a golf club and I have access, or or I get an email that says, please read, this is why we top dress, then I'd like to think I probably would read. And, and even better in the modern age, I'd much rather watch a video. If I can watch a three minute video rather than spend six minutes reading an email, I'll, <laughs> I'll watch the video every time. Absolutely no problem. Uh, I'm a 16 year old in a 42 year old <laughs> brain, really. I'll, I'll always watch the video. So that's again, and you know, members, if you've got, you know, that mem these members that you have educated this year and last year with your videos, they're probably going to be members for the future. So they now understand and they probably play, they may be playing in a group with two or three other guys and maybe they, one of them hasn't watched the video and they're able to explain, they're able to share the knowledge by you giving them the knowledge, aren't they, James? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, like I said, you know, it, it I, I try and put it, like I said, it, layman terms, and you know they, they they do genuinely seem to enjoy. And of course, I I try and make the videos uh, sort of fun. Like I do have a little a little joke now and again in them. And yeah, you know, we'll get, yeah, we'll <laughs> get onto the, the hairstyles at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, um, like I said, you know, because if 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 the if you just see in a boring video, and like I said, the good thing about Twitter because it's only two minutes and twenty seconds, that's long enough the last thing you want is people to lose interest. So if you keep yeah. them short, sweet, and able to understand, you know, everyone's going to, well, hopefully enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and they, they do. The feedback, like I say, it seems to be 100% positive. Let's move on to another topic that you covered. It's, we'll, we'll go into it briefly because you explained it quite a lot uh, earlier, James, your pitch mark yeah. repair video. Now, pitch mark, I, when I talk pitch marks, I always like to give a shout out to Greenkeeper Dave uh, in the Midlands at Licky Hills. I think it was his initiative a few years ago. He started, well, I think he started the National Pitch Mark Repair Day uh, and he stuck with it for a long time. And it was one of them. I used to feel sorry, not for, for him, but I used to feel sorry for the cause really, because it was like, why do we have to roll this out every year? Because it should, and people go out and then they're hot on repairing pitch marks for two weeks. And then all of a sudden, you yeah. know, it's not on Twitter. The the poster that was the wonderful poster that you could apply and they'd send out to you that probably got taken down from the pro shop. Someone had taken it down from the bar and replaced it with the horse racing night versus <laughs> horse racing night. And people had forgotten about pitch marks. You explained earlier wonderfully, James, how the best way really to repair a pitch mark is to come in from the side or come in from the back and push the, the damaged area of to have anyone watching the video if you look at my hand and you've got a pitch mark, that's where the ball's come in this way, squash the grass up onto itself. The best way to then sort of come in is to push that bit of grass back onto itself rather than, again, if you're watching the video, sort of what you see a lot of people doing is trying to go down low into the ground and sort of forcing the whole pitch mark up. What, as, as James again explained, what you actually then do is break the root system down. So you won't break all the root system down, but what you may well find is you've repaired the pitch mark in the sense that you have evened the surface, but you come back to that in three or four days and you will have a browning off of the area where the grass leaf or, or the grass, the piece of grass itself is damaged and potentially dead or more than likely dead. Not all of it or not all of the grass. Um it's pitch mark says I don't want to get don't want to be controversial here, but golfers could and should be better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, this was the idea of the hair because <laughs> right right now I'm doing I've nearly finished my um, my management course and I used a bit of an issue here with advertising because I use the hair for people to remember the video. Yeah, so of course. They, they think about pitch marks and they think, oh, hang on, that idiot with the hair. <laughs> of course, you put two and two together, they'll think, oh, hang on. I remember he, showed, he, he explained how to repair a pitch mark. So do you know what I mean? I, that, that was kind of the reason for the hair. I mean, obviously, it did have a few more laughs than it should have because uh, no, <laughs> it was a bit of a crazy uh, hairstyle. But, you know, it, it, it does, it, you know, like I said, advertising works. And, you know, hopefully people will remember the video. Like I said, you like I said at the end of the video, you just remember the greenkeeper with the crazy hair, and hopefully it, that will stick. You know, I, I will retweet it again in months to come or years to come, whatever. It'll, it'll always uh, 
it's one of them, isn't it? And again, as a greenkeeper, I don't want to come on to this podcast, my, my podcast, and moan about golfers. You know, I need, we need golfers to sustain our profession. But it's something that, you know, that they can, they should be, you know, they should be, anyone who's played golf from a young age, you'd like to think they were educated in repairing a pitch mark at, at a young age. Some people will say, you know, well, the pro shop could help out. I don't really know if the pro shop should have it, be having to remind people. What I don't particularly like, I don't particularly like having to put signs out on tees or on greens, collars or aprons. Please repair your pitch marks. It's unsightly uh, in the age of, you know, the cost of everything. I, I'm not going to call out anyone, but if I phone up a local rep, they probably want 25 quid, 25, 30 quid for a sign nowadays. Ryan at Tassett, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> You know, so there's an expense, really. So yeah. if if you are listening to this as a golfer, as, you know, people say, if you go onto the green and repair yours and somebody else's, you know, you shouldn't have to repair someone else's. But if you're walking up the green and you see one, it doesn't hurt to stop and do it. And if you watch James's video, you'll know exactly how to repair them. And if you, watch, again, watch the video with James with his multicolored hair, hopefully that will <laughs> jog, jog your memory. Um <laughs> Pitch mark repairs, let's not say anything more on that. And we'll move on to the next point, James, which I thought was actually a really good video. And there was a guy who'd posted a video about the same time as you. I can't remember his name, but he'd done a particularly good bunker raking video as well. Because bunker raking is, it's a chore. It's a, I find it a bloody chore as a greenkeeper. Uh, and as a golfer, you know, you've got you've got better things to do than rake bunkers, but you you need to rake bunk as well. But it is your video. Explain to us, James, a few problems that we as greenkeepers will experience from a from a, a bunker that, you know, if we if we come to a Friday, let's say we've raked the bunkers every day, but there's been a busy golf course. What problems are we likely to experience with sand distribution and a few other things? Can you just explain it to us, James? Yeah, I mean, well, like you said, you know, golfers, some are pretty good. Some will obviously rake the bunker after them, but obviously if they rake it wrong, like I like I've done in the second video with the congregating of the sand at the sides, because like I said, with the front of the bunker is normally the steepest part. It's not really where the golfer will rake because nine times out of ten they play in their shot from either the middle or the sides. And like I said, you said um, one of the guys done a video where with the sand being pulled back constantly yeah. or pulled back to the sides. Obviously, they think there's no sand in the bunkers, but obviously there is. So, all right, some bunkers won't have sand. That, that can be down to anything with budget cuts, things like that. But, you know, nine, nine times out of ten, there is sand in the bunkers. It's just either on the sides or at the back where it's getting congregated. And like I said, I showed in my video where I threw the ball at the front of the face where it's nice and thin and it bounces off. But then on the sides and the back, then there's absolutely loads of sand. Well, I try to teach them to... In, you know, I, I don't mind them raking up or down as long as it's very light. So they can do all the nice raking, heavy raking in the middle. But as they're on their way out, I like them to just keep it light as they're coming out of the bunker, whether it's pushing down or up. Because the reason why I say pushing down or up with the sand is if you've got original bunkers from, say, 80, 90 years ago, they've been built, your chances are the soils are the soils that were on the golf course, indigenous soils, you know. So they might have stones in the faces, like we've got a couple. And of course, if you're too vigorous, then pushing the sand down, because like some people uh, teach in uh, videos where you you know keep pushing, keep pushing. But if you're too nuts with it, you'll release those stones yeah. into the bunker. So that's why I put, like I said, some greenkeepers will have a totally different um, you know view on that, and I, I don't mind that because it's it's different for you know one course is different to the next. But I I like to keep it light on the on the edges because they said you don't want the stones you know it's one thing having no sand but you know if they got a 150 pound sand wedge and they're pinging a stone <laughs> yes. you know what i mean it's like <laughs> they, they're not going to be too pleased with that and you don't want them leaving a you know leaving on bad terms so so yeah that's what i said i you know i tried to keep it simple you do want the sand back in the middle but obviously that's what i said when you're coming out you know be courteous with the rake you know don't don't be too nuts with it so it's either gentle rake up or down and uh yeah. 
and it's uh, it, it is why I mean down on on my site on the Kent coast. Obviously, we experience a lot of sand blow. Most golfers will experience a lot of sand blow. So, at s- some you know, there's there's numerous reasons why sand isn't in the right place. But yeah, I've worked on on some sites are more sort of inland non-revetted almost a, a flat style bunker where you will find the majority of the sand finds its way to the back and that that can be down to to the golfers and yeah uh bunker raking ideally it's a two-handed job as i've seen in the other video if you could get two hands on the rake it does make your life a bit easier but it's it's things like that again james i can imagine uh you'd probably I would imagine you have to be a little bit careful and you want to be quite courteous with your videos because you sort of explained you're not really doing the videos for the green keepers, are you? You're doing it for, for, the, for the members. For the members. Yeah, and for members and, yeah, members of other golf clubs. And, and like I said, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tell them, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. I'm trying to keep it friendly and just, you know, like I told you before, green keepers, are, they're doing their best to produce the best they can. And if the members can just you know, contribute and help a little bit, you know, everything will sort of work together. So that, that's, that's, it, that's the main reason. Yeah, that, that harmonious relationship, really. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the, I've, I've worked on a few sites. And to be honest, the majority of the time, the relationship between the membership and the green staff was a fairly healthy, positive one. Obviously, as, as you touched on earlier, it, and it's not just golf members everywhere in life you are going to have people who aren't particularly happy with 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 something at the golf club you will always have a member or two who thinks you should be mowing the greens more the greens should be faster you know five minutes later someone's going to come in and say the greens are too fast um that's that's the nature of of life isn't it uh, yeah. i was i i'd nearly forgot but you did a particularly interesting mowing video didn't you that was that was that the more recent one james uh did i you... think i've done another two since then i've done one uh the difference between rotary mowing and obviously greens mowing yeah. so obviously cylinder cutting and i think the last one i did was on aeration air race so aeration is i don't think i've seen the aeration one but it's it's a good it's a good discussion point isn't it and going back to the top dressing you've got the greens playing well yeah. looking good and we all know i've said before just because a green looks good it doesn't necessarily play well but let's hope it does but the mem or the golfer will turn up the member will turn up and say i played on them last week they were fantastic and now you've got that bloody pro core out there or the, or even yeah. worse the verti drain now, yes. I have seen your video, I think, thinking back, because you went on to explain, did you explain we are relieving compaction, you know, and we're trying to allow for that gaseous exchange to take yeah. place? Because, yeah. and this is probably what the members of the, the golfers need to understand. I think compaction is fairly easy to understand. Anyone with a sort of a base knowledge of, of how things work, will understand if you walk across the same area of grass constantly, you are going to have compaction issues. Again, I'll refer back to a football goal mouth, you know, wear and tear, all the yeah. action goes on. You've got a goalie standing around for 90 minutes, wandering, even if he's having a, even if all the action is at the other end, he's still wandering around that goal mouth. Much the same as the centre circle, you know, the particularly heavy worn areas of a pitch by a football or a golf, you know, if you've got a particularly small green or maybe a funneled entrance, you know that that small entrance is going to be so much foot traffic, you're going to get compaction issues. And by using the Procore, which is for, for people who, who who don't know green, the Procore is a, is a pedestrian machine that, that has a moving heads and, yeah, tines, Tines, small tines, sort of up to anything up to what would you say, James? Five to six inches, really, on a pro call. Maybe, maybe not quite that much. Uh, and then we've got the heavy duty pro call, what you, which you will always find on the back of a tractor. And again, people, you know, you can verti trade down to 14, 15 inches. People will say you can get down to 18 to 20 inches now. But it is disruptive, James, isn't it? And golfers, you know, if if you're going out for your weekly game of golf and you know, me or James has just verti drained the first green and perhaps the roller hasn't been on it or perhaps 
we might not even if it's winter we might not be top dressing uh but if the top dresser hasn't been been passed yet it will be disruptive so you you can forgive people who get slightly annoyed with that but the the sort of you went on to explain that gaseous exchange and how in that sort of not necessarily that thatch layer, but that sort of top layer where you grow that root root zone layer, you know, where you've got your, your roots doing all the yeah. good stuff. You know, you do get a buildup of certain gases, which are, you know, a toxic to the, the roots, aren't they? And yeah. by aerating, we, we allow those gases to leave, to, yeah. to, go, to go out and we allow oxygen basically down into the, the root zone. Um, what was the reaction to that video, James? Because I could almost imagine that aeration is a sort of a, a polarizing discussion because from a greenkeeping point of view, we'd get greenkeepers on here who would say, if you didn't do anything all year apart from aerate, you will be all right. It's Some people would say it is the most important thing. And you could have a golf club member who'd say, I never want you to do that ever again. Yeah. Um, how did How was the reaction to that video? Yeah, again, it was um, it was really good. And like I said, where, where we are in my stake, we're probably on the worst soils you could ever imagine, being peat and clay. So, of course, we get a lot of build-up of these bad gases. And, of course, I've shown um, the members, sometimes we get these bubbles, sometimes uh, in the greens as well. So, obviously, I've shown them, you put a spike in, and then it releases the gas, and the, the bubble just goes back down, and they're absolutely amazed by seeing it. And then that's why I said... I explained with the aeration, it's doing the same thing. You're relieving the compaction and you're relieving all these toxic gases, you know? Yeah. And um, and yeah, like I said, when when I first started greenkeeping, I, I always was curious when um, Steve was going out spiking and because I, I was only sort of just starting out then and I was asking personally and I always remember him saying to me, you worry about what's happening on the top. I'll worry about what's happening underneath. And yeah. that, stuck, that stuck with me because it makes sense now because I look back and I think, yeah, the most important part is what's going on underneath because if underneath isn't all right, the top surface ain't going to be right. So, no. so yeah, the, the aeration was a really important one because, like I said, they, you know, they don't, uh, they don't really like it when we put the holes in the greens because, yeah, you know, you're not going to get a great role. But, you know, it, it is probably is a you know one of the most vital jobs of doing that that's why we've tended to go more with the g2 twice a year the air to g2 which yeah. is if anyone's listening is uh, three spikes and it blasts air into the soil so of course you get a lot less disruption because you only get the three holes on the surface and it's blasting everything underneath rather than millions of holes on the surface and sort of spoiling the roll then for the golfer yeah but, so you're talking um, you're talking about a machine that basically it injects high pressured air down into the sort of the the area that we've been discussing the area that in a spiking machine you're trying to access sort of from the top in a in an abundance of or yeah. spikes you're talking about the air 2g2 the machine that offers you know three points of entry across what roughly a, a metered square with it or metered uh, i think it's about Oh, it's got to be about a meter and a half, is it wide? Yeah. I think, and then okay. obviously you've got the three prongs that go in. You've got the compressed air, and then they go down to. Um, you can obviously vary the depth of the time. Obviously, we can't because you know at some point there is a few rocks in our greens. Yeah. So we we've only used we only use the smaller time, but obviously you know it's better than nothing, and of course it does blast the air. I prefer not to do it in the winter if we can help it because. We got obviously on wetter soils. It's like for a, a course that drains because we're on wetter conditions. It kind of doesn't frack the soil. It sort of just lifts it rather than, you know, breaking it up. But obviously any any air is better than nothing. So, you know, we do we do our best. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it is a really important job. And like I said, that's another reason I did that video because... Like I said in the beginning of the video, if we don't breathe, we die. If the greens don't breathe, they die. So, you know, air, air is everything. It's it's worth pointing out, isn't it? And it's sort of a funny one that uh, sort of pointing out to, to people who might, might not know or might not understand that those roots that are, you know, the, the most important thing for that, that lovely 
piece of grass that you see on the top, those roots, they actually like airspace. They like room to do, you know, they don't want, yes. you know, you just described your soil, yes. which does not sound like fun. If you imagine a heavy clay, peaty soil, imagine as a little grass root trying to penetrate your way through that and yes. get deeper, well, not necessarily deeper, but find what you're looking for, you know, your moisture, your nutrients, that's much easier for a little grass root to do in a broken down, not necessarily a big pocket of air, but if you have got a nicely decompacted, ideally where I am, you know, we're spoiled, lovely sort of natural dune sand, the roots yeah. can plenty, plenty of room, but where James is and in that soil he's describing, you know, that, that aeration work, it really is essential because without that root system, you know, you've got nothing on top. So I mean, that is uh, that video again. I would sort of really say push that video as much as you can, James, because that is one that they're all fantastic. Um, I cut you off really about the mowing video. So you talked about the difference between a rotary mower and a cylinder mower, and and that's quite interesting, isn't it? And again, maybe just take a little bit longer, James, and uh, explain to us. Obviously, I I I think I know the difference between the two, but. but a cylinder mower is is a finer mower, multiple blades turning, you know, in this direction. If you're watching the YouTube video, sort of rather than a rotary mower, which is a single blade spinning on sort of its axis, uh, aiming to bully the grass into submission in a sense, isn't it? Whereas a cylinder mower is offering you a fine cut through multiple particularly sharp blades turning on themselves continuously. I probably haven't explained that very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's pretty good actually. But no, I did that video because I have I have had a lot of um messages from golfers from when I done the leather jacket video. And um yeah, one of them particularly asked, you know, what how you know why is the the greens, why do you have a specific mower for the greens when you you know can you just use a you know a standard lawn mower? So of course I, I didn't mind the question because at the end of the day, if if you don't know. The answer to that then you know same you with me what you I, don't know yeah exactly so i, I thought oh a perfect opportunity to explain and that, like i said i kept it simple so i, I don't know have you seen the that video yes but I held, yes. I held the paper and i showed what action a rotary will do because even though a rotary does are this going know, on was it there <laughs> yeah that's it so um but yeah i i tried to explain the best i could and even though uh, like because they, they do say uh the golfers will say, oh, you know, a rotary mower will still give you a nice finish, and it will. But what I try to explain in the video is it's actually tearing yeah. the, 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 the grass, you know. And, you know, they, they, they couldn't believe that, that it actually does tear. Because so you look un under a microscope, the rotary cut absolutely destroys the grass, where yeah. you've got the cylinder cut then, which is literally like you've just snipped the grass with the scissors. And that's exactly how I explained the video with the rotary tap in it. <laughs> yeah. Like that. that's, and then he's got, although I did cut the paper with a green keeping scissors, stupid me. <laughs> and of course I was the whole, cutting. The whole cutting scissors, yeah. <laughs> I only um, realised after it, it was a green keeping scissors and then of course it was cutting in the bloody circles. But, um, but no, I, you know, it got the point across, even though I said it will roll pretty decent on that. And then when I held it up, it was... <laughs> <laughs> bumpy you know but um but no yeah it got the point across the you know the difference how, how we cut the grass and why we use that type of mower for like greens and fairways and approaches because it, you know it's fine turf whereas rough is well it's what it says it is it's rough yeah it doesn't, it doesn't need that um that you know fine fine cut so yeah it's a nice uh, i quite enjoyed that video because it, it when I, I even after i watched it back i thought you know it's nice and simple simple to understand yeah so yeah that, that was one of the ones i was quite proud of out of all of them to be honest with. well i mean like, again i keep saying that they're all fantastic but a video like that and again not going out to green keepers we'd like to think anyone who's been doing it for a while had done their level two done their level three would understand the difference but even the most educated of golfer is probably not really then they're, they're never going to be exposed to the reason why to the reason why unless they choose to to find out and they've got busy you know we've i've got busy life i'm busy enough being a greenkeeper i don't come home and study what <laughs> other professions do i haven't got time i've got my life to get on with and i've got my 
my but it, but it's worth mentioning it isn't it james that in an ideal world well, in an ideal world you know if we had unlimited budget and unlimited manpower we'd probably be out there cylinder mowing and as james has explained the cylinder mower you know you've got a wonderful sharp cylinder with multiple blades and a particularly sharp bottom blade and you might be contactless cutting or there might be slight contact cut so you're you're going to catch that or trap that grass blade yeah. sword in between your sharp bottom blade and your sharp cylinder and whew, make a wonderful cut and in an ideal world we'd be out doing our semi roughs and our first cuts with a cylinder mower a rotary mower is designed to cut larger areas faster more efficiently uh, and let's and i think the other thing to probably mention is a rotary mower is going to require a lot less monthly maintenance than a cylinder mower isn't it james so that's why yeah. we're out you're right i mean my i do a lot of rough mowing down at on our site, I, I do a lot, you know, I use the, I cut the driving range most weeks with the big uh, rotary and my blades will be, you know, are, they'll get a sharpen up every six to eight weeks and get replaced at the end of the season. And that will be enough. You know, it's whereas a green cylinder will potentially be in every two or three, if you're going out and you're cutting nine greens, say, a, saying if it's cutting nine greens every morning you're lucky enough to have two mowers out there it'll probably need the man mechanic if he's got time will have a look every time it comes in but but on these smaller golf courses where manpower is low and they're busier the mechanic might he'd still need to get around to look at it weekly but they do require more maintenance don't they those cylinder oh. cylinder mowers um so that's that um We've touched on most things. I've probably talked more than I should have, James. Um, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> future, future content. I don't, it don't, I don't want to ruin. If you, if you're planning on sort of keeping it all a secret, but could you, um, could you give us a little heads up on potentially what you've got in mind for the future, James? And, and do these, do these videos keep running forever, or um, have you got a? <laughs> well, yeah, future content. I mean, I'm going to try and cover sort of mostly everything where it's you know we're gonna i'm gonna be covering um fertilizing uh simple things like why we're removing do uh but yeah you know I, i'm gonna try and cover most things i i don't know if the videos will carry on forever i'd like to to keep doing them but i also don't want to lose that um how do i put it i i, I don't want people to just think when they when they see a video it's like oh, another one of them Do you know here what I mean? he is I, again yeah <laughs> they <laughs> probably want, think that about me it. by now <laughs> <laughs> no, i just i, I want to keep it fresh and obviously um yeah I'm, I'm enjoying doing them right now and like i said it's it's new and you know people i hope are enjoying them like i said it, it's not i'm not touching on green keepers with them at all because obviously it, they know what they're doing they don't need to be realistically watching my videos they might do for a laugh as yeah. a few of my friends, and a few of my friends are be messaging me, you know, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just tell them, you know, I'm trying to help uh, help golf clubs really, and you know, if that um, gives me a bit of a name, then so be it. I'm not doing it to become too famous or what have you. But uh... well, you got. I mean, I thought it was very good because, and you know, over at Bigger, they were they were. I can't remember which video, but they jumped on board with one, didn't they? And, and really got it out there. And that and that's important, really, because, like you say, you're not trying to get turf famous. You've got a little bit turf famous, but it's everything we do. It's why I, you know, I, I said to you all fair. This podcast didn't start about greenkeeping it started about my battle with alcoholism uh, and i didn't start doing podcasts to to get myself out there i got it to raise awareness of of a problem i struggled with and not you know we're not necessarily talking about uh problems between golfers and greenkeepers but if you can break down small barriers make make your membership and other memberships aware of why tasks are being carried out then that can only be a positive thing going forward yeah yeah like i said that i am gonna do as many as i can i mean you know it is probably gonna go on i'd like to think for most of the year i mean i might sort of thin it out uh, once you know one a fortnight to make sure where there's you know enough i, I don't want to cram too much in at once you know yeah. i have been trying to do one a week if i can but obviously we're coming into quite a busy time of the year so it is 
you know, I, I know it's only two minutes, but uh, you know, like I, like I said to you earlier, a lot of work does go into, and I, I don't just turn up and do the video. I do yeah. sort of half script it. So I, I yeah. will make notes and then sort of produce it. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I am going to try and keep doing them for as long as I can. And, um, you know, there is plenty of content to cover. I, I think anyway. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I would, I would encourage you. Yeah. I mean, there is, anything we've been doing it long enough anything you can think if if you can think of it it's probably worth doing a video isn't it because i mean i know something as simple as whole chat whole changing is simple to us but i would be amazed if your average golf club member understands the process that goes into changing a hole i mean it is a it's a fairly quick process. And once you've done it a few times, it's, it's, it's a repeatable process. Uh, if you've got good kit, it's a, you know, it's a easily repeatable process, but um, people, people would probably not be out fully aware of the process. No, I mean, that's another thing I will cover in time. I think that is on my list. This um, I've got quite a decent size list for the next sort of uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, I, like you said, if you can think of it in green keeping, I, I the problem I've got is I don't want to make it too technical. I, like I said, I don't want people to lose interest. So I want to try and yeah. keep them simple. So yeah, it's, I'm not going to say it's difficult, but you know, there are certain jobs that we're doing where you think people are just going to watch and think, you know, mate, I'm not watching that, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, you know, I'm going to try and keep it, uh, keep it easy. And, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, keep them flowing. <laughs> my, um, my, one, my final question, really, James, uh, and I should have really asked you at the start. You mentioned Steve, your 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 current boss, head greenkeeper, course manager. I assume he's got one of those titles. Uh, is he your regular cameraman, or have you uh, do do you switch it around? No, he is my cameraman. Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> he's a nightmare sometimes holding the camera because he's trying to make me laugh, and of course I'm trying to keep serious and. He's only trying to make me laugh because he knows he won't film another one. So I've got to get it spot on. And if I laugh, then that's it. That, that video's going up. So, yeah, it's one of, <laughs> it's one of them. Like, he decided to, uh, I don't know if you've seen it in the Rotary uh, mowing video, he decided to uh, pass a little bit of wind <laughs> as I was in the middle of doing the video. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't hear it because I can tell you now if... I'd have heard it. That would have been the end of the video for me because I would have been on the floor laughing my head off. <laughs> but uh, wow. no, he's, he's a great guy. Like his, like I said, I've been with him for 18 years now and uh, yeah, I enjoy every minute. And uh, yeah, he's brilliant. Good Can't stuff. fault him. <laughs> All right, well, before we say goodbye, I will just remind everyone, um, if you're watching us on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I will put James's Twitter feed in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, I will have already edited and superimposed everything onto James, so you'll know where to find him at Twitter. If you're listening to us via the audio or on Apple or Spotify, just, again, find the show, follow the show, share it around, give us that five-star review. Uh, and we do have a buy me a coffee page. You know, this podcast doesn't cost a lot to run, but there are certain upkeep costs. And if you want to make a small donation, that would be much appreciated. James Matthewman, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast, mate. Uh, and I'd love to get you back on in the future. There's, there's always plenty of stuff to talk about in greenkeeping. Uh, and, you know, I'm looking at forming a few sort of round the table discussions. Actually, I've got a few things in mind. I obviously did a podcast with, Paul Kennedy, local to me recently, and he he suggested that there would be a few sort of roundtable discussions to be had. And I, I certainly think you'd be a great man to get on and uh, hold a positive discussions. We don't there's 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 a few negatives in Greg. Even I've highlighted a few in certain podcasts. Try to put as positive spin on, but um, going forward. Um, I'd like to think maybe you'd come back and join us again, James. So all it leaves me to say, James, thank you very much for being a guest on Henry Weston's Old Mate, the podcast, another turf edition. Thank you very much, Stu. Thoroughly enjoyed it, mate. Thank you, mate. <laughs> thank you, mate.